We are jumping into a really important paper today. It's called LIJEPA, Provable and Scalable Self-Supervised Learning Without the Heuristics. And honestly, if you work in self-supervised learning, this is one you need to pay attention to. It could uh, really change how you approach things. Absolutely. The central problem it tackles in these joint embedding predictive architectures, or JAPAs, is something called representation collapse. A huge problem. It's basically where the model learns nothing useful, yeah, and yeah. it has forced researchers to pile on all these, you know, brittle ad hoc fixes. You mean things like stop gradients, these complex teacher-student network special normalization layer? Exactly. It turns deep learning into this slow, really high maintenance ritual. But Lejeba comes at this from a theory first perspective, right. and it just sidesteps that whole mess. The authors actually prove that the ideal the mathematically optimal distribution for your learned embeddings is the isotropic Gaussian. And critically, they don't just leave it at theory. They deliver a new, very efficient regularization objective to actually achieve this called sketched isotropic Gaussian regularization, or SIGREG. And the result is, well, it's pretty profound. LeJep is stable. It's fast. You get rid of almost all the heuristics. Yeah. You're basically just managing one single hyperparameter, mm -hmm. lambda and it's getting state-of-the-art results. What's really wild is that it validates in-domain pre-training on small specialized data sets. Right, which means it's challenging massive foundation models like Deno v3, which were trained on, what, 1.7 billion generic images? Yeah, it's a huge shift in thinking. Okay, so let's start with that fundamental theoretical piece. Uh -huh. Why the isotropic Gaussian? Why is that the answer? It feels like for years, people have just been using tricks to stop the feature space from collapsing. They have, but this paper argues those tricks were just fighting the symptoms, not the uh, the underlying disease. So what's the core idea? Well, GPAs are designed to learn these high dimensional embeddings. The authors say the architecture has to do two things at once. One, solve the prediction task, and two, make sure the embeddings it creates follow an isotropic Gaussian distribution. And that distribution is optimal because it what spreads the information out perfectly. Exactly. It perfectly balances the information across all dimensions. There's no wasted space, no squash dimensions. And when you fail at that, that's when you get representation collapse. Right. Either complete collapse, where every single input maps to the exact same point, or dimensional collapse, where all your features just map to a thin line or a plane in a high dimensional space. And those heuristics we mentioned before, the whitening, the stop gradients, they're just playing whack-a-mole with these failures. Totally. The authors actually provide some really rigorous proof for why this is so damaging. They looked at linear probing, which is a super common way to evaluate these models. That's where you freeze the main network and just train a simple linear classifier on top of the features. Right. Exactly. And they asked, what does bad feature geometry do to that simple classifier? And what do they find? If your feature space isn't a perfect sphere, if it's... Uh, anisotropic, what happens? It's just devastating for your downstream task. They proved that if your features are anisotropic, it dramatically amplifies both the bias and the variance of your classifier. So even if the model doesn't fully collapse, the error just gets magnified. Massively. Think of it geometrically. An anisotropic space is squeezed in some directions and stretched in others. This unevenness makes the model parameters you're trying to learn just incredibly uncertain compared to what you'd get from a perfectly spherical isotropic space. So even if my feature has the same amount of energy, let's say, if it's distributed unevenly, it just fundamentally sabotages the next step. That's the perfect way to put it. And it's not just for linear models. They extended this proof to nonlinear methods too, like k-nearest neighbors and kernel methods. Their theorem one basically establishes that the isotropic Gaussian is the unique optimal distribution. So it's the first time we've had a unified principled answer for what the geometry of our feature space should actually look like. The very first time. No more guesswork. Okay, so the theory is solid. We need our embeddings to be isotropic Gaussian. But proving a high dimensional distribution is Gaussian sounds like a, well, a computational nightmare. How do they actually enforce this? This is the genius of SIGREG. It's the implementation breakthrough. So they need a way to check if their current embedding distribution matches the target Gaussian distribution, and it has to be differentiable and scalable. Right. They frame the whole thing as a statistical hypothesis test. The null hypothesis is our distribution is the target Gaussian. And the trick that lets them beat the curse of dimensionality is slicing. Can you break that down for us? Yeah, think of it like this. Imagine you have a really weird high dimensional fruit and you want to know if it's a perfect sphere, like an orange. 
checking the entire surface would be incredibly hard. But what if you could just take random one-dimensional slices through it and check if every slice looks like a perfect circle's cross-section? I see. If all the slices check out, the whole thing must be a sphere. That's the intuition. The hyperspherical kramer wold lemma gives it a rigorous statistical backing. It proves that if you can match the distributions along all possible 1D random projections, then the high-dimensional distributions have to match, too. That is brilliant. So they just analyze a handful of random 1D slices instead of the whole D-dimensional space. Exactly. And since they're just averaging the results of a simple test over, say, M slices, it scales beautifully. And you might think you'd need a huge number of slices, a huge M, but it turns out you don't. Why not? Because deep network outputs are generally quite smooth. And more importantly, with every step of SGD, the algorithm picks a new set of M random directions. So over the course of training, you end up covering the space really well. A small constant M, like even 16, is enough. Okay, so they have the slicing mechanism. But what about the actual statistical test they run on each slice? Why did they reject simpler things like, say, moment matching? Because simpler methods can be fooled. Moment matching just checks if, like, the mean and variance match the Gaussians. But the authors show the model can still find these collapse shortcuts while keeping the first few moments correct. Ah, so it's not robust enough. Not at all. Plus, moment matching can have these unstable, unbounded gradients, which makes training a real headache. So stability is key. Mm -hmm. And other options, like CDF-based tests. Too slow. They usually require sorting the data, which has a complexity of n log n, and that just doesn't work well for distributed training across multiple GPUs. So that brings them to their final choice. The EPS pulley test, which is based on the empirical characteristic function. And what makes that one the gold standard for this problem? It hits all the right notes, it's naturally differentiable, it's easy to compute in a distributed setup, and this is the most important part for Stability Theorem 4 guarantees its gradient and curvature are uniformly bounded. Meaning? Meaning no matter how weird or messy your input distribution gets during training, the loss landscape stays smooth and stable. It ensures a really robust optimization process. No more exploding gradients. And all of that theoretical rigor, all that focus on stability, it really pays off in the final architecture, which is just shockingly simple. It's so elegant. The total loss is just a combination of the normal predictive loss and this SIGREG term balanced by that single hyperparameter, lambda. And because Sigreg solves the collapse problem at a fundamental level, they can just throw out all that other scaffolding. Exactly. For any ML engineer listening, think about this. No more stop gradients. No more teacher-student networks with those finicky EMA schedules. No more explicit whitening layers. You also mentioned they even got rid of register tokens, which are a common, if a bit confusing, stability hack just for vision transformers. Gone. It's a massive reduction in complexity. The core implementation for the loss is something like 50 lines of code. Yeah. It runs with linear memory and computational complexity, and the default hyperparameters are really robust starting points. It basically shifts the whole R&D focus away from fighting instability and toward, you know, actually designing better predictive tasks. Oh, this is where it gets really exciting. The empirical validation. If the theory is right, Lejekla should just work everywhere. And it does. It's incredibly robust. They tested it on nearly 50 different models from eight architectural families. ResNets, VFITs, Convnex, you name it. It worked out of the box. And that stability holds up when you scale, right? It does. They showed these smooth, stable training curves even when they pushed the model size up to 1.8 billion parameters. It's real proof that the stability from the EPS pulley test isn't just theory. It works in production. But for me, the real game changer for anyone running these big SSL jobs has to be the quality of the training loss itself. Historically, that loss has been, well, kind of useless. Completely useless. It told you nothing about how good your features would actually be on a downstream task. Well, Jeppa flips that on its head. It really does. The combined loss function is incredibly informative. They found a super high Spearman correlation between the training loss and the final downstream accuracy. We're talking 85 to 95 percent correlation. Uh, hold on. So you're saying after years of basically training these models blind 
and only finding out if they were any good after a slow, expensive evaluation. Mm -hmm. Now we can just watch the training loss. Essentially, yes. This allows for robust, label-free model selection. You can do cross-validation just by monitoring the training curve. They even show that with a simple scaling law based on Lambda, they can push that correlation up to almost 99%. That is a massive operational win for MLOps teams. Just huge. It's a game changer for work. Yeah. Huh? Okay, beyond efficiency, let's talk about the results in specialized domains. Because this really challenges the whole industry's obsession with more data is always better. This might be the most profound result in the entire paper. Legepa, when it's trained from scratch on small specialized data sets like Galaxy 10 for Astronomy or Food 101, it consistently outperforms state-of-the-art models like DanoV2 and DanoV3. Let me just be crystal clear on that. Legepa, trained only on, say, a few thousand galaxy images, is beating a model that was pre-trained on 1.7 billion generic images and then fine-tuned. Yes, that's what the data shows. Clear in-domain superiority. It challenges this whole paradigm that you must have a massive generic data set to do effective SSO. Legepa proves that a principled, mathematically sound approach can unlock incredibly effective domain-specific pre-training, even when you don't have a lot of data and the features it learns are still rich and semantic. The theory didn't come at the cost of feature quality. Not at all. The visualizations they show are amazing. You see spontaneous object background separation, perceptual grouping, all without any explicit segmentation labels. And it works for video too. Yep. The attention maps it learns are good enough to do unsupervised video object segmentation, tracking things across frames automatically. The semantic understanding is definitely there. So, to sum it all up, Lechepa really feels like a shift. It connects this theoretical necessity, the isotropic Gaussian, with a practical, stable, and scalable tool in Segreg. It really does. They've effectively managed to eliminate all the complex, hand-tuned heuristics that made working with GPs feel like a dark art. It seems like they've established this single, statistically optimal design principle. It makes you wonder what comes next. Well, that's the provocative thought, isn't it? If we can get these kinds of results, even beating massive foundation models, just by getting the feature geometry right, then maybe the future isn't about stacking more and more complex architectural tricks. But instead. But instead, maybe it's about refining these fundamental mathematical mechanisms. It poses the question for everyone listening, how far can we really push performance, not by being clever architects, but by being rigorous mathematicians?